I think I have to share my screen. Whoa, okay. Um, this meeting is being recorded. Okay, <laughs> let's get going. So, um, all right, everyone. Um, that was the wrong button. <laughs> Sorry, one minute. My computer is a little bit slow. Um, one minute. All right. Um, Okie dokie. So um, let's get into it. So this class is um, Introduction to Astronomy. It's a pretty basic course, but um, we're going to be talking about a lot about astronomy, um, of course, but what I mean by that specifically is our solar system and constellations and the more typical thing you think of when you think of astronomy today. Um, Today specifically, it's going to be about, you know, cultures and how they have related to astronomy in the past, their uses of astronomy, and, you know, their view of how the universe worked until we got up to a certain point and how things changed after that. Uh, so it's going to be a lot about sun, moon, stars, and not as much about the universe. Um, but before we start, I'm going to say um, a teeny bit about the class. Uh, like I'm saying here, for thousands of years, astronomy has been a focus of scientific interest, cultural interest, of course, like I'm going to talk about today. And to this day, it remains one of the most intriguing branches of science. When you, um, I feel like when one of the things that excites people, young people like you guys the most, is hearing about the stars, about black holes and cool stuff like that, because we don't know as much about it as we do like sciences like chemistry or biology, because it's just not something we can reach as well, but it's something that always has, piques people's interest. Anyway, um, during this course, you guys are going to learn about the inner workings of stars and planets. You're going to learn about how um, society has thought about them. You're going to learn about um, all sorts of things. I can never teach anything, ev everything, <laughs> but I'm going to try and um, cover as much as I can and make it interesting. My goal is to provide you guys with um, a deeper understanding of how and why the astronomical world works the way it does. Um, yeah, anyway, um, okay, we have a little roadmap. roadmap. Um, first, I'm gonna be talking about use of the stars, how like cultures dating thousands of years back have, you, have used the sun, moon, and stars um, in their daily lives, in their broader lives, like with religion, agriculture, sustaining their, um, like their livelihoods and everything. Um, it's a lot more than you would think really, but there's so many uses that people have came, come up with over the years. Um, I'm also gonna be talking more about how that socially affected people, how they developed their system, um, they might've developed their um, social systems, religious systems around the solar system and stars in particular. I'm also gonna talk once again about the cultural significance it feels a little redundant, but there are important things that differentiate each of these. Anyways, I'm going to talk about maybe a contentious topic, astronomy versus astrology. Um, they're both really cool fields, but there are important differences between the two, and I'm going to talk about that. I'm also going to talk about um, recent developments we've had in the scientific field, um, why they matter, all of that. And also, I'm going to talk about what we do today, what our goals are for the future, um, how we're planning on accomplishing those, all of that. All right, so I think I said this while people were coming in, but it's going to be a little bit of a talky um, thing that we're doing, so I'm sorry about that, but I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, anywho, I had an icebreaker, uh, but um, I did this in the chat room once like earlier, but if you guys want to say anything, um, answer like one of these questions, uh, feel free to do so in the chat. I'll just say, um, I'm Audrey Cluson. I go to Carmont. Uh, I'm a junior. I play double bass. I do ballet. Um, and I like science. Um, I also have quite a few cats, and one of them might pop up onto the place uh, during this. But I'm just going to head over to the chat room to see what you guys are saying, maybe, if you guys want to say anything else into the chat. Oh, wow, there's a lot of people. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't know if you guys can see. 
Uh, if you want to say anything, you can say anything. Ooh, Beyonce. <laughs> Feels valid. Um, anyway, I don't want to take too much time, but if you guys want to say anything, I'll read it out maybe. Yeah, just to get to know you guys. Taylor Swift, yes. I have so many friends who are Swifties, and I really need to get into Taylor Swifting. Yes, agreed. <laughs> totally. Um, Adele, oh my gosh, yes. I love some of her music. That was like my childhood, yes. <laughs> agreed. Okay. I don't want to spend too much time, but I would like to know you guys. I have a new person. Math, I love math. Yes, oh my gosh. <laughs> that makes sense. A white Mul multipoo named Ali. That is <laughs> nice. That sounds really cute. Nice. Okay. Anyways, um, if you guys have anything else that you want to send in the chat, I'll definitely read it at the end of the um, class. Okie doke. I oh my God. <laughs> Moving on. Okay, on with the lesson. I'm glad to get to know you guys. Okay, so our first little subsection is how um, cultures have historically used the stars. Um, we have a cute little graphic and <laughs> Um, okay, so our first use that is a major use um, that honestly is still something we think about today is timekeeping. So there, people have made clocks and sundials. You probably know a little bit about how sundials work. Uh, the sun, depending on where it is in the sky, and obviously it changes position throughout the day, will cast a shadow on a specific part of a little dial, and that tells you the time. Um, and it only works for 12 hours of the day during the daytime but it was such an important innovation when it was um, created because it allowed people to do, thing, to do things, to keep time so that they were able to do things um, before any sort of mechanical innovations occurred. Um, and it's a really, really important innovation. Uh, calendars have also made use of this, the movement of the sun, the moon, the stars uh, throughout the year. So uh, if we see like, I don't know, can I do the little thingy thing? I can do the laser pointer. Okay, over here we have an example of um, a calendar. I don't remember if this is a solar calendar or a lunar calendar. I think it's a solar calendar. I'll talk about that in a minute, but um, it has all of the different positions of the sun, all of the, which correspond to the different months. And um, it's so detailed, as you can see, it has the day, um, month, year, and here's also an example of a solar calendar, um, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, and it tells you like um, what time of year it is based on how the sun moves. So, uh, okay, lunar calendars are based on the cycle of the moon. This is kind of the most obvious one you would think about when you think of basing, keeping long scale, long term, keeping track of time long term based on um, astronomical objects. So of course the moon goes through different cycles, I'll talk about it next week, um, and we can tell um, that it's, um, it goes in a cycle and we can easily keep track of time based on that. Uh, lunar calendars aren't actually as um, precise as solar calendars are because, I'll talk about this next week, but um, the rotation of the moon is slightly off with the, um, like the cycle that a moon goes through is actually um, slightly off by I think it's two days in relation to where the moon actually is in a month. I don't know how to explain that exactly, but um, a lunar month is a little bit less than an actual, um, the actual month. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, the moon like goes around in a different um, period of time to um, go through like this, the phases of the moon than it does to actually go once fully around the earth in relation to the sun because the earth is traveling around the sun. So it takes just a little bit longer for a month to fully be completed. And because of this, the um, lunar month doesn't exactly line up with the year. And after a while, things get very off track. And that's why people tended um, to develop solar ca calendars more of the time. It's defined by the period of the sun's orbit. It's divided up um, in our case, the one the calendar that we use is divided up into 12 months, and it's um, based on where the sun is in the sky because it moves like through the sky throughout the year differently. And this was really helpful, of course, to people um, who wanted to keep track of 
like when to plant things, when to um, do events, uh, like religious events, cultural events. And overall, having a solar calendar was a lot better than a lunar calendar because it was more precise. Okay, um, our second uh, use uh, historically was for navigation. So uh, you might have heard something about star charts. Um, it's a map of, if we think of like a globe, uh, but inverted. So we're actually on the inside of the globe. That's exactly what this are, th what this is. It's a celestial um, sphere and put onto a chart kind of. And people used it to navigate to navigate the sea because of course there weren't, aren't any landmarks and it um, could help determine your path to your destination. So this kind of thing works because depending on where you are in on the earth, you can see different parts of the sky because like if you imagine a globe, if you're up here on the globe, you can't really see, um, you're looking up, you're on the northern hemisphere of the globe. You can only really see um, so much of the solar sphere or celestial sphere. And if you're on um, the bottom, you can see a totally different part. So that's why star charts work. You can see where you are in relation to the solar sphere. Um, and uh, with that, you can determine where you are on the globe. Uh, so like I said, it helps sailors determine their paths to their destination. And an astrolabe or astrolabe, I'm not quite sure. It was also a really cool tool. It's this thing over here. It looks really pretty. Um, it was also used by people at sea, so it this one has a lot more to do with math. You kind of use the angle of um, where a specific star is in the sky, and this thing, I don't know how it works, but it has the constellations and stars kind of engraved in it. So depending on what angle you measure to a specific star, it'll tell you where you are on the globe, which is really cool, and it was also um, a lot like the sundial. It, <laughs> like the sundial, it was a really important innovation that helped people, um, you know, um, have a piece of technology to determine things without actual mechanical innovation. And it determined date, time, and location, which is really impressive. And it's a really cool piece of history. Um, it's similar to a compass um, in the way it looks and its uses. Anywho, um, oh, this is a star map um, or a star chart. And you can kind of see how it's an equatorial star map. So that means that this line is the equator. So it curves because the Earth um, is a globe. So when you put it onto a map, it's not going to be perfectly flat. But anyways, you would determine what stars you see in the sky, uh, what stars are like exactly above you or a little bit above you, and then use your astrolabe to determine like um, the angle and what that means. You use like trigonometry if you guys like know trigonometry to like use, determine the distance you are from like where this star would be when it's like exactly above you. I don't exactly know to how to describe that, but anyways, you would use that to determine how far you are from the equator and with that, where you, need, where you are and where you need to go. Um, anyways, this is also just really pretty. So um, it's something that was once again, really important for the time. Anywho. Um, I think I mentioned this a minute, ago, a minute ago, but another really important use of astronomy and the stars, sun, moon, and stars was for agricultural purposes. So ancient civilizations um, didn't have Google Calendar, of course, so um, they used the location of the sun and stars to determine seasons. Um, we all know like when it's winter, the days are a little bit shorter. When it's summer, it's, the days are really long. And the sun also um, moves up and down in the sky. I'll talk about this next week, I think. Um, but the um, time and location where the sun is in the sky at noon actually changes throughout the year. So ancient civilizations figured this out and they used um, the sun and stars to like determine seasons. So this was really useful, like I said, for like planting crops. So you could actually know when to plant crops and like, when they're going to be due and um, how you can, you know, you get the point, like just to um, determine like your use of the earth. Um, so star, star formation, star formation, such as the seven sisters, you can see them right here, were used as markers um, in the sky. And as the sun was um, 
passing through these markers. This is really similar to the zodiac. Um, you, we could determine like what season it was, what um, and when to plant crops because of that. Um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, anyways, so we're moving on to the more social aspect of astronomy. So, um, okay, our first um, society that used astronomy was often called the first city or first society of the world, humanity, um, and it's ancient Mesopotamia, specifically the city of Babylon. And this was in the 1800s before common era. So like, I, I can't do math right now. That was like um, through almost 4,000 years ago. So crazy. Um, of course, if you're a human and you're on the earth, the one thing or one of the most obvious things to you is going to be that at night, the stars come out. So of course, throughout society, throughout humanity, um, the stars have been used as um, for, like I just described, various different purposes. And these are the stars and moon and planets and sun have been one of the most consistent things throughout history because, because of that reason. Um, so Mesopotamia was um, one of the ag agricultural societies that I um, explained. They used the sun to est establish a solar ca calendar with guidance for planting. So um, they had a calendar kind of like this. It was a solar calendar and they used it for agriculture, which is really cool. This is actually um, a piece of writing that they found. I don't remember what the script is called, but I, I, heard, I read a story that at first they thought it was like the instructions for a game, but then they realized it was actually instructions for planting crops based on the sun, moon, and stars, which is really cool. Um, they also um, recognized the periodic nature of the stars, which is important. Like, of course, the periodic nature of the sun and moon are really obvious, but there's also um, a cycle that the stars go through as we orbit the sun. Um, and they use this to their advantage. They also applied mathematics to um, daylight. So they calculated, I was talking about a minute ago, how the um, daylight fluctuates and how the sun fluctuates, um, like the path of the sun fluctuates throughout the year. So they applied math to this, which is really impressive because you, um, if we think about it, we can't like really, I like, I've never noticed that until it was pointed out to me, but they applied mathematics to this, which is nice. And also uh, religious people believe that omens could be sent through the stars. Um, so they like look to it for guidance, that kind of thing. Um, so that's cool. Um, our second society is India. So this was in 1400s before common era. So math about um, 2,500 years ago, um, or like, start, I don't mean like only 2,500 years ago, like for both of these, I mean, like we've found evidence from at least that long ago. So um, uh, in India, the study and ca cataloging of astronomy was a lot um, really connected with religion. Um, a lot of astronomical information has been found in religious texts. It was um, related to various deities and um, related to events, and um, this is similar to um, Mesopotamia a lot. Um, India developed a solar um, calendar between 300 and 365 and 366 days, which is really precise, and it is also still what we use today. Um, the length of a year is about roughly um, 365.25 days, so it's exactly that. Um, they focus focused mainly on tracking the sun and the moon um, rather than the stars as much. Um, it was for their purposes. They um, improved on the ideas that Greek philosophers had and an astronomer <laughs> an astronomer predicted the concept of gravity. Um, it was this is really interesting. It was found in his writings um, like I said like two or three thousand years ago um, and he predicted a force that brought things to the earth. It wasn't just that things fell down, it's that there was a force and it was related to earth. And that's really important. So um, in India, there was a lot of astronomy going on. Oh, and I forgot to mention, this is an astronomical observatory, which is really cool. Um, they had it like above the ground, um, as close as you could get to the sky. And it's really precise. I don't exactly know how it works, but this is 
cool. And it still survived until today. Wow. Anywho, um, onto ancient China. Um, they developed complex lunar and solar calendars. Um, so like I was saying a minute ago, there's two different variations and uh, they focused on both of them. Uh, China also focused a lot on like accurately um, and mathematically calculating things. So they also accurately calculated the length of a year as well as other important values. I don't remember what they were, but it was something about with um, the distance to the mer <laughs> meridian, uh, which is the perpendicular thing to the equator. So um, it was, um, I read scientific readings and it said that um, all of their pr predictions were very, very accurate. Um, so China also focused on predicting the um, dates and locations of eclipses. When I say locations, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try and explain this. So um, eclipses, um, the entire Earth can normally see at least a little bit of it, or a big portion of the Earth can normally see at least a little bit of an eclipse. But because of how, um, if you imagine like a light, the sun is shining a bright light, and then very far away from it, we have um, the moon. So the moon is only going to bl block a portion of the light that comes from the sun, so that um, on shining onto the earth, there's still going to be a lot of sunlight. It's only going to be one specific point that's fully blocked, um, where the moon fully blocks out the sun's light. So um, eclipses do have um, specific like locations, and um, this like travels over the, like the period of time where the sun is blocking out the moon. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'll probably try and explain that a little bit better. And a different class. So anyways, um, Chinese astronomers were able to predict the locations and dates of these eclipses. Um, also, something that's pretty cool is that um, Chinese astronomers had the first and only um, recorded observation of a supernova from this time period. I, um, I don't remember how exactly it was described, but basically there was a burst of irregular light. They, they recorded and they were like, hey, that's weird. So first um, recorded observation of a supernova. That is cool. Um, anyways, um, Mesoamerican, more on the western side of the globe, societies um, linked astronomy and celestial objects a lot to religion. Uh, they also linked uh, agriculture and other se seasonal activities, like I was saying um, a few minutes ago, with the sun. And this calendar that I showed a while ago, oh, it says on here, but it was an Aztec calendar. So they had really, really accurate um, solar calendars. And it's really pretty. Um, and like I said, there's so much detail and it's all used to do crops for religious purposes. Um, yeah. Uh, an another mathematical uh, observation that this society had was the accurate length of a month. So. I'm not going to try and describe the month thing again, but um, they accurate, accurately measured it, which is very impressive. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, Mesoamerican societies focused on the galaxies um, more than other societies. They had a lot of lore about, I don't know if lore is the right word, but a lot of like legend, and they focused a lot on the Milky Way, which um, is a very complex co topic. So, nice. <laughs> Anyways, um, Greece and Egypt, I feel like I've heard a lot more about this kind of astronomy um, than other ones, so I guess I'll just like go over it a little bit, but they mapped star movement um, uh, with the circular, circular movement of the stars. Um, Ptolemy developed mathematical movements for um, mathematical models for the movement of the planets and the sun. Um, I will say though, uh, this society thought that um, thought of the solar system in a geocentric, um, yes, a geocentric model, which means that they thought that the Earth uh, was the center of the solar system and that the sun and planets revolved around it, which is not correct, uh, as we probably know. But they did develop really complex um, models to try and account for the differences, the discrepancies that they found between their model and the actual movement. So I'll explain that a little bit more later, but they did have some pretty complex models. 
Um, they re related their religion to the constellations and movements, movements of the planets. Um, you've probably heard uh, Greek uh, myths and, is that the right word? I forgot, I don't know. Um, about the movements of the planets, uh, they, oh, I said this a second ago, but they had a geocentric view of the universe, and they also focused a lot on philosophy and our place in the universe. So Aristotle and Plato and um, other philosophers, uh, philosophy was a really big thing, and those kinds of people focused on, like, um, how humanity relates to the universe, so, like, why were we created, why, why are we here, what is our purpose? Um, I think, uh, yeah, and I think the reason we have a lot more um, documentation on this kind of thing is that people, for whatever reason, actually, I don't know why, but um, more, a lot of writing has survived from this time period. Oh, and, oh no, I forgot, um, oh, I didn't put a date there, but uh, this time period, uh, we know a lot about from 400 BCE, so roughly like 2,500 years ago, or 2,400 years ago. All right. Oh, and also Europe after the Renaissance. Um, I'll say a little bit from a little blurb about the Renaissance. It was a period in European history or in history in general, um, but specifically in Europe, when um, people revisited the scientific philosophical, philosophical and artistic findings of earlier societies. So um, they took all the writings of a bunch of societies that I just mentioned and re revisited them. So Astronomers like Nicholas Copernicus, this guy, um, revisited Ptolemy's um, model of the solar system, which, like I said, was geocentric. So they thought that the Earth was the center of the solar system. And Copernicus realized that, actually, no, the center of the solar system is the sun, and the Earth um, revolves around it. This was a pretty, <laughs> I guess, earth-shattering realization to have at the time. And he realized that his observations um, did he have a telescope? I don't know. Um, I think, no, no. Um, but his observation, um, uh, coincided more with the fact that the sun is the center of the solar system and the earth and planets rotate around it. Um, so this was a very important, um, decision, but at the time it was really highly contested. People, um, specifically the church of, I think he was in England, um, believed that the universe was, no, not the universe, the, well, they did believe that the universe was centered around the earth, the universe and the solar system. So they believed that, no, this isn't true. Um, but he said <laughs> no to them and he proved it, um, or he tried to prove it with science. And some things happened later on um, and we eventually got to where we are today, where we, um, it's pretty um, not contested that the sun is the center of the solar system, but anyways, um, this was an important discovery. There was also the invention of the telescope, which um, led to greater and greater abilities with astronomical observations. And um, with the Renaissance, um, the, enlighten the Enlightenment followed that, and it brought even more interest in scientific thinking and scientific experimentation and observation. Um, so this meant that people... Um, couldn't just say that they thought something was true because it logically made sense. They had to say, I think something is true. It logically, it logically makes sense. And also here is my observation and possibly experiments that prove my hypothesis. You guys pr probably heard about the scientific method. This is a really, really important part of uh, scientific thinking and a scientific process. So this was something that came, up, came along in the 1500s. So only 500 years ago, which was pretty recent. I mean, of course, it was a long time ago. No one knows. No one alive now has, no one alive now was alive 500 years ago, but still, in the grand scheme of things, pretty recent. Um, anywho, okay, cultural significance um, of astronomy. So, the constellations, um, this is probably what we think of when we think of astronomy. Sorry, I've been talking about culture for a little bit, but I'll say um, currently, uh, I think it's some organization, uh, international astronomical, astronomical organization, I don't know which one, but um, we recognize 88 constellations. These are like, of course, there are only so many stars in the sky. So um, these ones, 
each each star is like a part of a bunch of different constellations from a bunch of different cultures, but we have picked 88 that we um, want to split the sky up into. Um, anyways, um, different parts of the globe see different parts of the celestial sphere. So like I was saying a second ago, every culture has developed lore around the stars and formed different constellations and different patterns out of the same stars, which is really cool. I have a little graphic over here. Um, it has, it's a little bit hard to read, but it has, all of a bunch of stars in one area and it has all of the different um, constellations that have been formed by different cultures. So I don't know, I just wanna make the point that like, um, we only have so many stars and there are a bunch of different stories and legends around um, groups of them. So uh, we recognize 88 um, constellations scientifically but there are a bunch of different constellations that people have uh, formed over the years. Interesting, these two stars are connected a lot Anyways, that's just a cool diagram, I thought. Um, oh, and also the, uh, the constellations and the legends that come with them from each, each society can tell us a lot about that society's um, values and how they saw the world, the universe. Um, ancient Greek legends often had, had um, morals attached to them, so that's why I say this. Um, and it's the same for every other society that developed forms of constellations. Um, I just have a bunch of art on here. Um, I think this is Nicholas Copernicus. This is a bunch of dudes during the um, Enlightenment. This is Vincent van Gogh's painting. This is um, ancient uh, Egypt, I think, with uh, this guy as a little, is that, I don't know, is that a telescope? I don't know. Uh, and a globe. Um, here, I think this is a medieval painting, but I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not sure, but it looks cool. This is a really famous painting um, with a shooting star. We'll talk about that later. Another shooting star. Um, this is more astronomic, astro astrological. Um, and this is Gustav Holtz, the planet, Holtz, the planets, um, which is a cool piece of music. You should check it out. Anyway, um, I also have a bunch of modern media. Uh, you guys probably know a lot of these. This is 2001, The Space Odyssey, The Martian, Dune. I have a copy of it. <laughs> um, I haven't read it, but it looks a cool book. Um, Hidden Figures, which isn't as much about astronomy, but it's really related to it. Um, Star and of course, Star Wars. I don't know what that one is, but it, I know it's important. Um, anyways, oh, something also I wanted to highlight. Um, it's not as much of a um, concrete like fact or anything, but I'd like to say that like our way of thinking it has um, been significantly significantly impacted by our view of the universe. Um, so, of course, I was talking about this a few minutes ago, but having a, a, a geocentric view of the universe um, significantly changed people's thinking, um, or like when people had a geocentric view of the universe, they had a very different thinking from when we now have a heliocentric view of the universe. So, um, not to say that they thought that they were the center of the universe, like individual people, but they, um, the fact that now we think of the universe as not something centered around the earth, but something centered around this, but as us being centered around the sun and the sun being centered around the center of a galaxy and a galaxy orbiting something in the center of the universe possibly. And there being a bunch of different galaxies, it's just a completely different way of thinking. And I think that's pretty cool. And also, this one is even more out there, but um, older societies, before we discovered that there, or before we theorized that there was um, a concrete beginning of the universe, um, people not necessarily thought that it would go on forever, but they didn't really think about that. And I've heard that um, societies thought of um, life as like going in cycles. So things would happen, the world would end, and then things would be reborn again. Um, and now we, uh, maybe people like still believe that, of course, um, like with, you know, our own society, but we also um, now believe that there was a beginning, or scientifically we think, like theorize that there was a beginning to the universe and that there will one day be an end. And I don't know, it's just a completely different mindset to view our place in the world philosophically, I don't know, um, little earth in the middle of the universe. Um, 
Anywho, so this one, astronomy versus astrology. So astrology is a really cool thing. Um, it's a system that re relates the movements of the sun, moon, and stars to the human condition, um, our own fate stuff. It has <laughs> been um, developed over thousands of years, and it's been really significant in different parts of the world and at different times. Um, it has a rich history. I think I just said that. Um, but <laughs> It's also based, um, specifically, it's based on where the sun is in relation to different constellations. So as we move through the year, as the Earth orbits the sun, um, Earth, sun, constellation, there's like a line that changes throughout the year. Uh, and this is where the um, zodiac comes from. I think there are 12 at the moment. And uh, it's really important. Um, and, uh, I th it's something that we all maybe have interacted with a little bit. Um, it's pretty fun. Um, but sa sadly there is no like scientific backing to, um, prove this theory, but it does make sense or not make sense, but it is something that we think about a lot. Um, and something that I want to point out is that, um, <laughs> okay, um, the, where the sun is in relation to the constellations is based on the tilt of the earth. So if um, the earth like changes its uh, tilt and axis, axis of rotation, um, it's gonna change like what where the sun is in relation to the constellations. And this is exactly what has happened over um, 11 or like over a few thousand years um, since astrology has been um, you know, developed in the last few thousand years. So uh, when, uh, whenever astrology was, you know, first being formulated, uh, the Earth's, like the North Star was Vega and over thousands of years that has shifted and now the Earth Star is Polaris. So what that means is that um, uh, the Zodiac has actually shifted over time. So it's not accurate anymore. Um, and there hasn't, some um, astrolog astrologers have like tried to make up for that, but um, the zodiac that is like the um, astrological zodiac calendar that is popular today um, do ha doesn't exactly take that into account. So um, that's just something. Um, and astronomy is the study of everything by beyond Earth's atmosphere. Um, and specifically, it's using scientific principles. So, um, like I was saying, the scientific method, observation, hypothesis, hypotheses. Oh, does someone want to say something? Hmm? Okay, sorry, I can't see you guys right now. Um, but hypotheses, experimentation. Yeah. Oh, sorry, do you have a question? No? Okay. Okay, if you have a question, say it. Um, Okay, um, sorry. Um, anyway, astronomy uses scientific principles um, like a conclusion and theory. And theories have also been justified using observation and logic that links those observations to reality. Anywho, um, we're getting on to recent developments in astronomy. Um, so I was talking about this a few minutes ago, but in the last 500 years, we've had a lot of development. So um, the heliocentric model was formulated rather than the geocentric model, that's Copernicus, Nicholas Copernicus. Um, Kepler's laws have also been formulated. I think I might talk about them next week, but they defined orbital motion in a way that we still think is accurate today. Um, I'm trying to remember them off the top of my head. It links um, the radius of something orbiting um, specifically a planet orbiting um, the sun, like the radius, also the um, period, so like the length of time it takes. There's one other thing, but I don't remember what it was, what it was. Um, but there are three laws and they are still valid today. Um, also, um, Galileo has made observations about the moon and other planets. He used scientific thinking um, and he made a few contributions to physics that we still think are very, very um, important today. And there was also Isaac Newton who developed 
not developed, not developed, but he um, developed a theory of gravity, the three laws of motion, and also telescopes. He, um, I think he developed one, and he also um, used them. Okay, um, so we've made a bunch, a bunch of um, important discoveries about astronomy that we didn't have previously, and that has led to more recent discoveries, um, such as um, Einstein um, proposing theories of how the universe works. You might have heard about them. Um, <laughs> uh, general, re general relativity, special relativity. I'm not going to try and explain that, but they are important, and they were like groundbreaking at the time they were released. He also developed a few theories of light, or theories like relating to light and how light travels, um, specifically like there, that there is a speed limit to light, no matter like where you are, where you are in the universe. Um, I'm not gonna explain that, um, but maybe later um, in the, like the last uh, uh, class in this series. Um, so also cosmic rays were discovered by Hess. Um, so like um, that's relating to far away astronomical objects um, that we can like see and observe by cosmic rays. Um, Hubble also discovered that there are galaxies other than the Milky Way. He got a telescope named after him. Um, dark matter has also been theorized. Uh, I'm not quite sure who did that, but um, it's a theory that I will definitely talk about later. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, the Big Bang, the Big Bang Theory was also um, formulated recently-ish. Um, these are in chronological order, I think. Um, and that is, um, of course, like, you know, the theory that there was a bang um, at the beginning of the universe and being of time, I guess, um, and that the universe is expanding and a, a bunch of things. I'll definitely talk about that one later as well. Um, and also this thing up here is um, cosmic microwave background radiation. <laughs> um, it's pretty complicated, but um, it gives a little bit of, uh, you know, like proof to the big, big Bang Theory. And it gives us a glimpse into the early universe when things were still forming. Um, and recent astro astronomical achievements. Um, are the moon landing in 1969. There were also a bunch of other, um, you know, really cool achievements before this, like the first human into space, the first thing into space at all, the first telescope. Um, but we tend to think of the moon landing, I think, a lot uh, because it's like, and, you know, that makes sense. It's pretty cool. Um, also, the Hubble telescope was launched in 1990 to, to observe far, really far away objects in the universe. Uh, this is, I think, one of its first pictures. It's pretty iconic. Um, it's also really pretty. Um, gravitational waves. This is really, really important. Um, we're, first ooh, <laughs> we're first detected in 2015. Um, this is related to it. So I think it was two um, either black holes or two neutron stars, just two really, really big faraway objects were rotating each other and because they were orbiting each other and because they are such big objects, they um, created significant gravitational waves which um, came all the way to us and we were able to de detect them, which was which proved a few things and was a really significant um, discovery when it happened, which was eight years ago. Um, also the first picture of a black hole in 2017 was taken I think there was also one taken a little bit earlier, um, I think it was 2009, but this one is like <laughs> more, um, it's like clearer. Also the James Webb Space, Space Telescope, which is pretty recent. Um, this one is a continuation sort of of the Hubble telescope and it's meant to um, study really far away objects, some of the first galaxies um, for, that were forming, all of that, and it is, I'll definitely talk about that one later, but it's really specialized and it's also a very cool um, achievement. Also, India very recently made a moon landing. Um, I think they're discovering, um, trying to like investigate water, uh, possible life. That is a very um, recent and very important thing that is happening. Um, anyways, oh, also we haven't had like um, 
uh, missions to the moon in quite some time. So yeah, okay, <laughs> this slide finally. Um, talk a little about a little bit about astronomy today. So uh, what do scientists mod and modern astronomers do today? We still use telescopes. They might not look the same as the traditional like looking into the sky outside of your window telescopes. Those are definitely still in use by um, people. <laughs> but um, uh, we use radio telescopes, which um, collect light that isn't visible to us, but is um, more useful to us. Uh, also X-ray, another type of light, infrared telescopes, another type of light. Um, all of that can um, detect light that's coming from really far away that tells us a bunch of different things. Um, and we can use it, like all of that data, um, in addition to visible um, observations to piece together the universe. We also use neutrino detectors. I don't, <laughs> I'm not gonna describe that, but do, neutrinos are type of particle um, and that we can use to learn things about the universe. There's also a lot of computer science and complex algorithms that are used to collect and interpret the data that we get from telescopes. Um, I don't know anything about computer science, but all of that is really, really important for astronomers to be able to use to study the universe. And cosmology is more the study of um, the faraway universe, the deep, deep space objects, and the study of the universe like holistically as a whole. Um, this um, deals with the origin, the Big Bang, the composition, what we are made of, what the universe is made of, what the objects are, and also the fate of the universe, <laughs> which I don't know, cosmology is a pretty cool topic that I'm going to get into later. Um, anywho, uh, uh, goals for the future. Um, overall, scientists um, uh, want to achieve a better understanding of how space space functions. There are some really, really complex topics that we haven't even begun to, com topics and questions that we haven't even begun to answer. So we want to gain a, a better understanding of these things. We also definitely want to explore the solar system more. It's the closest thing to us. We want to do things like um, go send people to Mars, possibly, um, to think about like living there to see if that's a possibility. Um, to see if life can survive there at all, to see if there's anything else in our like achievable like places we can go um, to explore. Uh, we also want to discover how and why and of what the universe was formed, uh, which is a really, really um, important topic that people are trying to answer. Okay, um, <laughs> I was trying to rush through that last bit, but we have a cahoot. Um, so, um, Let's get started. Uh, I tried to um, kind of highlight these things uh, during the Kahoot, but I'm going to start it now. Um, and you guys can join, and we'll just go through it pretty quickly. So um, my computer is slow, sorry, but I'm trying to load it up. <laughs> OK. Uh, da, 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 da. I've never done this before. Oh no. Okay. Um. Game pin. You guys probably know how Kahoot works, but if you don't, you go to kahoot.it and then you press um, join, and that's our game pin. A minute. I just need to check how many. Okay, we have people. Yay. Okay. <laughs> um. Nice. Wait. I'm just. I'm just gonna check. Many people I have? Okay, I think nine of you. <laughs> Planet Moon. I like I like the name. <laughs> okay, this is really chill. Just to, to kind of check your standing. I'm sorry, I know I've been talking for a really long time. Also, if you guys have questions, um, I guess I'll be quiet for a minute. And you can say them. <laughs> sorry, I've just been talking nonstop. Right. I think we need um, two more. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, 
I might just start it. And if you guys, um, we are running a tiny bit late, so uh, let's get going. Okay, it's fall themes apparently. Um, uh, yes. Okay, joke. Okay, so which, um, this is from the beginning, which activity have celestial objects not been used for? So planning agricultural activities, keeping time, migration, navigating. Uh, oh, and I wanna say it's not been used for, sorry, just to make that clear. Is this all me? Is this everyone? Okay. Okay, sorry, that might have been a little bit confusing because um, it's not been used for. Anyway. Um, okay, Jason, good job. And also Bellum. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, um, true or false, the layout of the zodiac, the astrological thing, has not changed over time. This one's another not. So I was trying to make it um, make you think about it. Okay, I think that's everybody. Okay, yay! Um, that is true. The layout of the zodiac has changed over time, and that's why maybe astrological things aren't as accurate. Okay, um, Vellum, you are number one. Yay! And a bunch of people got it right, so <laughs> okay, I'm glad. Okay, uh, third question. What ancient cultures used astronomy? Oh wait. Okay. Yes. What ancient cultures used used astronomy? I think that's everybody. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I tried to highlight this a lot, but pretty much every culture we can um, find record of has used astronomy in some way, shape, or form, which is a pretty significant thing. And that is why it's important. Okay, <laughs> still number one, um, planet, moon, and Jason are next. <laughs> okay, um, how many constellations are there? This is a little number one, uh, pretty straightforward. If you don't remember, that is fine, it's, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, a lot of people remembered, okay, good job. All right, competition. <laughs> Bellum is still number one. And I, I guess, is number two. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, Kepler's laws. Uh, this one, uh, you might not remember, but it is pretty significant and still historically accurate. I think I tried to highlight that, but if you don't remember, it's totally fine. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. It was, um, this one's a little bit complicated, but Kepler's laws highlight orbital motion, uh, the motion of the planets around the sun specifically, in our solar system specifically, I mean. But that is related to gravity and it's also related to the stars and yeah. So it, it makes sense. <laughs> Whoa, okay, <laughs> Bellum is going, is doing a really good job. Okay. Um, and to whom do we attribute the discovery that Earth orbits the sun? I think I mentioned that um, there was one person who did, um, who did like technically discover this first, but we attribute this specifically to one person, uh, like in modern. Okay, uh, yes, that is <laughs> uh, Nicholas Copernicus. Yeah, he was the guy. Okay, whoa, okay. <laughs> Um, okay, last question. Uh, what is the study of the universe called? Not the solar system, but specifically the universe. <laughs> I tried to make this one pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty good. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, cosmology is the study of the universe, like deep space as a whole. Um, astrology is more like the um, cultural, like, our relation to the stars and universology. That might be a thing, um, but not quite the term I'm looking for, but okay. Well, we're done. Okay, good job, guys. Um, all right, number three, we have planet moon. <laughs> nice. Okay, um, number two is I, and number one, 
you know who it's gonna be. He's them. Okay, good job. All right, and Jason in. Um, yeah, all right. Good job, everybody. Um, thank you so much for sitting who through my lecture. Um, I just wanted to say uh, I have.